Hello. So, everyone on my OnlyFans knows <laughs> everything happened in my was not yesterday. Um, and uh, if I didn't make you enough with my impromptu panties, bathtub, extravaganza, <laughs> up close and personal with every hair on the vagine. Um, I will tonight in, in uh, reading. Um, yeah, I'll try to get a lot of reading done. Probably be chatty. <laughs> I missed you. I have withdrawal, but I don't see you. Every minute. I should read in a Southern accent. Tonight, someone wrote me, uh, one of you guys, that thought that I was from Louisiana. <laughs> Do I talk Southern? I think maybe sometimes I try to, but I did live in Florida. I think, does that count as a South? For a little bit, for, for a little bit. Southern California, by the way, it's supposed to get hella rain here. This weekend, I'm thinking of going grocery shopping again tomorrow. If it doesn't rain tomorrow, because it might be my last chance for a bit because of the uh, rains that come in my way. How does this, is the song go with Louisiana when it goes, she come from Louisiana with a banjo on my knee. Oh, Susanna. Is that... All right, I see you guys. I have to come back. All right, now, where are we? We were on chapter four, beginning. My neck was as stiff as a board the next morning from my sleeping. I do. I really have to clean up this mess here. <laughs> From my sleeping without a pillow, Prozac, the spoiled brat, had hogged it all night and had only reluctantly. reluctantly abandoned it to perch on my chest and claw me away for her breakfast. I plucked her off and rolled over, only to see Samoa's manuscript looming on my night table, waiting to be edited. All 900 pages. Oh, groan. But I had to look on the bright side. Now that Samoa knew about Prozac, I'd be getting made service. I could even ask him for another pillow. See, there's always a silver lining. Who's going to get killed? Working on the silver lining principle, I got dressed and scooted over to the buffet where I scored a design breakfast of eggs, bacon, and cheese Danish for me and baked ham for Prozac. Countless calories later, I made my way up to the sports deck where I ran a few brisk laps on the ship's jogging track. Okay, so technically I didn't run any laps, but I did watch other people run laps. Does that count? Having burned off approximately three and a half calories, I, <laughs> I headed over to the ship's computer room 
to check in with my parents and make sure they'd arrive safely. I'd recently bought a fancy new cell phone that did everything except brew coffee. One thing it did not do, however, was work on board ship. So I'd arranged with my parents to communicate with them via email. I found the computer room sandwiched between the ship's chapel and the photo studio. Several webaholics were seated at a bank of computers getting their daily internet fix. One of them was Kyle Pritchard. Clad in a designer polo and Bermuda shorts, he was tapping away at his computer. At his feet was an Atachi case, no doubt made of some endangered species, and spread out next to him was what looked like a bunch of financial statements. Hi, Kyle, I chirped. Hmm, was his cheery reply. Careful to put plenty of space between us, I settled down at the computer and tried to get the internet connection. For some idiotic reason, I thought it would be free as part of my free all expense paid cruise. But alas, the helpful holiday staff are on duty informed me that I wasn't about to be calmed on emails. How much is it? I asked. A buck fifty. Gee, that wasn't so bad. A minute, he added. Holy Moses, I made a mental note to keep my communications with my parents to a bare minimum. But after reading my emails, I'm afraid I wasted valuable internet minutes staring into space, agog at the thought of the cops charging into my apartment on a cat napping call. It was so typical of daddy, creating an uproar over nothing. I love him to pieces, but the man is a born crazy maker. I swear, he's caused more ulcers than pepperoni pizza and jalapeno chilies combined. How mom has put up with him all these years, I'll never know. Of course, mom is not without a few quirks of her own. Not only is she constitutionally incapable of remembering my cat's name, she's probably the only person on the planet to, to move to Florida to be near the home shopping channel, not for the weather or the oranges. Somehow she's convinced she gets her packages faster that way. But I couldn't waste any more time dawdling over my emails. It was almost 10 o'clock, time for my first class of the cruise. I have to confess, I was a tad nervous. When I first asked Paige how many people I could expect at my class, she replied, oh, the big name celebrities can attract hundreds, but someone of your caliber, and there was no doubt she ranked me somewhere in the Three Stooges caliber of lecturer, the most you can expect is 50, maybe 75. 75 people gag to me and I was a cast of thousands. The only other writing class I'd ever taught was at the Shalom Retirement Home, where I could count my students on the fingers of one and a half hands. So it was with butterflies frolicking in my stomach that I raced back to my cabin to gather the 75 handouts I Xeroxed for the class. Just to my luck, the elevator took forever to show up. And when it finally did, it stopped at every floor, which meant that I was five minutes late when I finally came puffing up to the Galley Grill restaurant where the class was scheduled to take place. By now, those butterflies in my stomach, stomach were doing the conga. My fear quickly turned up to flop sweat when I walked into the restaurant. There seated at the tables that had been set up for the class was a grand total of five students, five measly people. What happened to all the others? I walked over to them, a sickly smile pasted on my face. Hello there, I said, my voice echoing in the cavernous restaurant. Welcome to writing your life story. Oh, hi, Arthur. How are you feeling? Um, I'm trying to feel better, you know? It's like, 
I feel like um, my issues likely stem from so much pain and suffering, trauma, anxiety, you know. I mean, I've been treated with such cruelty, abandonment, neglect, disregard. And then it's weird, but then I still have like all this hope. Like <laughs> I still get like, well, keep keep trying, girl. So that's where I'm at. <laughs> okay, writing your life story. Hello there. Oh, oh yes. I prayed some latecomers would straggle in. Maybe some of them got held up in the elevator like I did. Yes, I had to think positive thoughts. A whole bunch of them would probably come streaming in any minute now. I introduced myself, and after explaining that I was no relation to the Pride and Prejudice Jane, I started passing out my handouts. A series of memory stimulating questions about my students' childhoods, their jobs, their marriages, their children, in short, their lives. If completed, I told them the questionnaire would serve as a memoir to pass on to future generations, or it could serve as a springboard to a longer, more ambitious project. All the while, I chatted. I kept looking at the door, hoping for somebody else to wander in. But alas, it looked like it was just me and my gang of five. So I said, my smile now frozen in place, why don't you all take turns and state your name and tell everybody why you decided to take this cor course? You, sir, I asked a bushy bearded guy with an opulent unibrow. I'm Max, he said. Actually, I wanted to take Professor Heinemann's lecture series on his Arctic explorations, but unfortunately he had to cancel his cruise. So the class was called off. So that's why Paige had offered the job. I was a last minute replacement and bingo was too crowded, he added. So I wandered in here. Great, nothing like an enthusiastic student to get the ball rolling. I'm Rita, piped up the woman sitting next to him, a wiry haired dame with small squinchy eyes. I'm president of the West Secaucus Women's Reading Club, and I never missed an opportunity to hear an author speak. Okay, at least this one had a vague interest in writing. On my last cruise, she announced proudly, I saw Mary Higgins Clark. Really? I said, that must have been fun. Yes, she was fabulous. Just fabulous. Utterly spellbinding. Looks like I've got a tough act to follow. Ha <laughs> ha. Hmm. She stiff, sniffed, clamping her arms over her chest, having clearly reached the conclusion that it would be a cold day in hell before I came close to filling Mary H. Clark's shoes. And what about you? I asked a long-haired teenage boy sitting at a table some distance away from the others. He couldn't hear my question, though, thanks to a pair of earbuds stuffed in his ears. Totally oblivious, he nodded his head in time to music from his eye. Pad. Pod. <laughs> Young man, I screeched. Who, me? He asked, popping out an earbud and peering at me through his fringe of bags. Yes. What's your name? Kenny. I couldn't help wondering what a kid his age was doing in a class like this. Well, Kenny, tell everybody why you're taking this class. My parents made me. They want you to help me with my book report on the Scarlet Letter. Oh, for heaven's sake. First Samoa and now this? It seemed like everyone on board had something for me to edit. 
I'm afraid I can't help you with that. This is a memoir writing class. Feel free to drop out if you want. I hated to lose him, but I was not about to play high school English teacher. Nah, he said, that's okay. There's nothing else to do on this dumb ship. Everybody here is like a hundred years old. Besides, my parents are paying me 50 bucks if I stay out of their hair for an hour. I nodded wearily to my last two students, a 60 something couple dressed in identical jogging suits, his blue, hers pink. We're David and Nancy Shaw from Seattle, the man said. And after 40 years of marriage, we're taking this cruise to renew our wedding vows, his wife chimed in. Eyeing their matching jogging suits, wide toothy grins, and early beetle bobs, I wondered if they always looked like each other, or if they were one of those couples who grew alike as the years went by. Anyhow, David said, we thought it would be a wonderful idea to write down our memories, to pass down to our children. Alert the media! At last, I had some people who actually wanted to write their memoirs. That's wonderful, I said, fighting the impulse to race over and kiss them. I spent the next few minutes giving my students a mini lecture on the principles of writing, trotting out the old show, don't tell adage, urging them to go for specific memories rather than sweeping generalities. Just remember, I said, winding up my little chat. What you write doesn't have to be perfect. Just keep writing. If you have difficulty, pretend you're writing a letter to a friend. Now, let's get started. Everybody take out your pads. I don't have a pad, Kenny, my teen angel, sulked. I don't either, Max chimed in. I do, Rita said with a virtuous sniff. I always come prepared. You can write on the back of these, I said tossing Max and Kenny some of my extra handouts. Then, just as I was about to give them their first writing exercise, a tiny white-haired woman drifted into the room. In her hands, she carried a tote bag, almost as big as she was. I'm so sorry I'm late, she said in a whispery voice. That's perfectly all right, I said, grateful for another mate on my motley crew. What's your name? I'm Amanda. Take a seat, Amanda. Here's a handout. We're just about to get started. She sat down next to Max and smiled up at me. Thank heavens this one seemed pleasant. Now, I want each of you to write about a first in your life. Your first date, your first job, your first day at school. Can I write about my first colonoscopy? Max asked. It's where I met my second wife. <laughs> talk about your love connections. That's fine, I said. Wait a minute, Rita piped up, poking a finger through her wiry curls to scratch her scalp. Aren't you going to talk about your books? I refrained from telling her that, aside from you and your garbage disposal, I had no books to talk about. No, Rita, I'm afraid not. But Mary Higgins Clark told us all about her books, she pouted it. She sold her first book, she said, turning to the others to spread the news, when she was widowed with five children. How interesting, I forced myself to keep smiling. But, as I've already explained, this is a writing course. But I thought we'd be hearing stories, reader one. The only stories in this class will be yours, I said firmly. Now, let's start writing, shall we? Rita's hand shot up. Are we going to be graded on penmanship? N there are no grades, just write. By now, I was this close to giving her a wedgie. Nancy and, you know, why is it so important you're first on something? Like, I think, Like, I ate a potato at some point the first time in my life. I don't remember the first time I had a potato, but I'm so much more interested in the next time that I'm going to have a potato than 
whenever the hell first time I probably ate mushed up taters in a baby food jar or something. What is going on in the chat? There's <laughs> looking sharp soldiers. Where is that from? What is that? Is that? <laughs> Is this, do you guys remember the first time that you timed out someone? <laughs> Nancy and David, the married couple, picked up their pens and started writing with gusto. The others were a tad less enthused, a lot of ceiling staring, and what I suspect was doodling ensued, <laughs> but at last I saw pens crawling across paper. The writing process had begun. The only one who wasn't writing was the old lady who'd come in after the class began. Instead, she'd taken a pair of knitting needles from her tote bag and was clacking away at what looked like an argyle sweater. Aren't you going to write anything, Amanda? I asked. It's fun once you get started. Just pretend you're writing a letter to a friend. Oh, no thank you, dear another sweet smile. I've already written postcards to my friends back home. Don't you want to write about your life? Oh, no, dear. Living it was enough for me. Clearly, the woman was not operating with a full deck, but I didn't care. I was just happy to see a smiling face. For the next hour, I continued to swim upstream with this bunch. Rita kept punctuating every assignment with tidbits from the Mary Higgins Clark files. In a stage whisper, that could be heard all the way to Cabo San Lucas. She kept a running commentary on how much more famous and entertaining Mary Higgins Clark was than yours truly. At first, I was gratified to see Kenny, the teenager, writing industriously, but when I peeked over his shoulder, I realized he'd been busy perfecting his pornographic cartoon skills. <laughs> Max nodded off somewhere during the second writing assignment, his jackhammer snores echoing in the empty restaurant. But on the plus side, you'll be happy to know that Amanda got a lot of work done on her Argyle sweater. My only shining lights were the married couple who attacked their assignment with gusto. At last, 60 painful minutes had come to an end, not a nanosecond too soon. That's all the time we have for today, I said, hoping they couldn't hear the relief in my voice. Kenny's hand shot up from the back. If there's homework, I'm not coming back tomorrow. There's no homework, Kenny. Just bring in what you wrote today and we'll take turns reading aloud. See you all tomorrow, I said, smiling my most appealing smile. As motley a crew as they were, I couldn't afford to lose a single one of them. Any questions before we go? My sweet white-haired lady raised her hand. Just one, Professor Hyman, she said. When are you going to tell us about your Arctic explorations? Chapter five. Talk about your demoralizing experiences. I wanted nothing more than to trot over to the Tiki Lounge and bolster my sagging ego with the frosty margarita, but it was only 11 a.m. and I simply could not justify the lugging down tequila at that hour of the morning. Besides, I needed to keep my brain cells perky for their upcoming bout with Samoa's masterpiece. So I trudged back to my cabin where I found Prozac clawing on a cashmere sweater she dragged from my closet. Several pieces of my underwear were also scattered gaily on the cabin floor. I'm glad you're having fun, I snapped, picking up the mess. I've been through utter hell. She scampered to my side and sniffed my ankles, then looking up at me with big green eyes. That could mean only one thing. So, where are my snacks? Oh, for crying out loud, pro, you ate enough ham this morning to feed an NFL quarterback. I'll bring you something later. After scribbling a note to Samoa, asking him to pretty please bring me another pillow, I grabbed his manuscript and headed up to the pool deck. I found a spot 
arrived in a secluded nook far from the frolicking crowds at the pool and settled down to do battle with do not disturb. The less said about Samoa's opus, the better. Let's just put it this way. I'd read better plots in my DVD manual. I spent the next few hours gritting my teeth in frustration, trying to decipher his minuscule scrawl. All the while, I could hear the happy shrieks of vacationers splashing in the pool. For a mad instant, I considered tossing the whole ghastly mess overboard, but sanity prevailed and I slogged on, breaking only for a late lunch at the buffet, a heavenly roast beef panini with just the wincyest chocolate chip cookie or three for dessert. When at my last eyeballs were begging for mercy, I packed it. I was heading past the pool en route to my cabin when I heard someone call my name. I turned and saw Emily Pritchard, surrounded by her entourage, Kyle and his wife Maggie, the formidable Miss Nesbitt, and of course, adorable Robbie, who was looking particularly adorable in cutoffs and a sleeveless t-shirt. With a jaunty wave, Emily beckoned me to join them. As I made my way across the deck, I became aware of someone else in the Pritchard party, Cookie's boyfriend, Graham, dashing as ever in his nautical blazer, was standing at Emily's side. I hadn't seen him at first, so engrossed had I been in Robbie's cutoffs, but there he was, his hand resting most trembly on Emily's elbow. How odd, I didn't think the hired dancers were allowed to fraternize with the passengers off the dance floor. Jane, how lovely to see you, Emily beamed as I approached. Is that a manuscript you're carrying? Nesbitt asked, catching sight of Samoa's masterwork in my arms. I nodded wearily. I preferred to think of it as recyclable waste, but I suppose technically it was a manuscript. How marvelous, Emily gushed. We get to see your new book before anybody else. Clearly, she hadn't glommed on to the fact that I was not a famous author. Actually, this isn't my book. I'm editing it for a friend. How exciting. Isn't that exciting, everybody? Oh, yes, Maggie said as Kyle cycled a yawn. Do not disturb. Nesbitt sniffed at the cover page as if it were a dead rat. And what have you guys been up to, I asked, eager to change the subject. We have had such a fun day, Emily said. We've been busy shopping. Indeed, I looked down and saw they were all carrying shopping bags from the holiday gift shop. I always like to treat everybody to little souvenirs of our cruises. Really, you shouldn't, Aunt Emily, Maggie said. You're much too generous. I'll say, Kyle snapped, darting to a none too subtle glance at the shopping bag dangling from Graham's wrist. Yes, my dear, Graham said in his velvety British accent. It was much appreciated, but most unnecessary. It was my pleasure, Graham, Emily said, beaming up at him. So, isn't, isn't Graham, is he the, uh, Is he Cookie's boyfriend that danced with her? Um, he's like basically a male gigolo. He's he is hooking up with ladies for souvenirs at a gift shop. <laughs> you guys, would any of you sleep with someone for a gift shop souvenir? You don't have to run to the gas station and pick you up with trinkets. Up to this point, I'd been avoiding eye contact with Robbie. After the way he ditched me last night, I was determined to play cool. But now I couldn't resist taking a peek at his face. And the minute I did, he hit me with his bad boy grin. Oh, rats. Why did he have to be so darn cute? I stiffened my resolve to be cool and distant and unattainable. But before I got a chance to give him the snub he so richly deserved, 
Our Peppy Social Director page got on the mic and announced that an exciting ice sculpture demonstration was about to begin. Sure enough, I had turned to see Anton seated at a table not far from us with some ice picks and a big block of ice. Ooh, let's watch, Emily said with childlike enthusiasm. I'm afraid I can't, my dear, Graham said. I've got some important business matters to attend to. What a pity, Emily's face fell. But I hope to see more of you later, sweet Emily. Then he took her liver-spotted hand in his and kissed it. Wow, this guy was Cary Grant and Hugh Grant rolled into one. Emily stared after him, dreamy eye as he walked off. Kyle was staring after him too, with the wary, calculating look of a pit bull whose turf has just been threatened. Come on, Miss Nesbitt said, grabbing Emily's elbow. Let's go see that ice sculpture. Yes, let's, Maggie seconded, hustling us over to get a better view. I tried to stay in the background off Anton's radar scope, but unfortunately he saw me in the crowd and waved. I smiled weakly and waved back. I have to admit, Anton lived up to his own hype. He wielded his ice picks with dramatic flair, picking and chipping away with the deafness of a neurosurgeon. Oohs and ahs erupted from the crowd as a bust of George Washington gradually emerged from the ice. He finished with a flourish, and the crowd broke out in applause. He was so proud of himself, I was surprised he wasn't joining in. It was then that I heard Robbie's voice in my ear. How's it going? I turned to face him, and in spite of myself, I felt my heart do a two-step. You all set for formal night tonight? He asked. Oh, rats, I'd forgotten all about that. I still hadn't rented an outfit. Maybe afterward, he was saying, we can go... I never did hear where Robbie wanted to go because just then Anton, ignoring the people who gathered to chat with him, came barging between us. Before I knew it, he had me cornered, his brightly orange face just inches from mine. I watched helplessly as Robbie shrugged in defeat and backed away. So, Jane, Anton said, when am I going? to get to your, do your buzz. Oh my God, that's direct. <laughs> Some other lifetime, mister. Seriously, doll, I'd love for us to get better acquainted. He smiled his version of a sexy smile, exposing a row of tobacco stained teeth. How about we rendezvous at my cabin tonight and I'll show you my instruments. Oh, wow, this guy was about as subtle as the bubonic plague. Sorry, Anton, I'm not interested. Come on, baby. All the ship's employees fool around with each other. It's a nautical tradition. Oh, my God. Ugh. I'm afraid you'll have to carry on that proud tradition without me. What's the matter? You married? No problem. I am, too. What happens on board stays on board. <gasps> Oh my god, you're ruining it. This said with the most nauseating leer. So, how about it, sweetheart? You ready for a ride in my love machine? Oh, please. The only thing I was ready for was a bark bag. Sorry, Anton, still not interested. That's okay, babe. He said, eyeing me like a sirloin in a butcher's case. I like a challenge. On that ominous note, he slithered away. Alone at last, I looked around for Robbie. But once more, he was gone with the winds. Chapter 6. Oh my god. I look like I... I look just like my grandmother. I was standing in the ship's former rental shop, staring at my reflection in a three-way mirror, and I swear I was wearing the same outfit my grandmother wore to my cousin Joni's wedding, a long funeral black skirt topped off with a matronly gold beaded twin sets, 
I don't know what that is. <laughs> Isn't this a little on the dowdy side? I asked the sales lady helping me. She was a tall, regal dame with her hair pulled back in a bun so tight. It was, I was surprised it wasn't coming out at the roots. You just need to accessorize it, she said with a brittle smile. With what, a walker? <laughs> Don't you have anything a little snazzier? Snazzy, snazzy. Not in your size, I'm afraid. Well, excuse me for not being a size two. How about this one? She held on a blob of dreary black lace. Wasn't Queen Victoria buried in something like this? Very amusing. But like Queen Vicky herself, she did not look the least bit amused. I stared at the gold and black number I was wearing and sighed. It was Dowdy Central, but at least it was better than Queen Victoria's Shroud. So, what's it going to be? The sales lady asked, more than a hint of impatience in her voice. You going to take it? I took it all right and paid 125 bucks for the privilege. I trudged back to the cabin with my granny outfit, stopping off at the buffet to pick up some poached salmon for Prozac. Okay, and some peanut butter cookies for me. After an afternoon with Do Not Disturb, I deserve them. When I opened my cabin door, I found Prozac pacing restlessly. Hi, sweetheart, I crooned. Mommy brought you dinner. She shot me a dirty look. It's about time. She practically knocked me over when I put her plate down. So eager was she to bury her pink nose in the stuff. I was just about to hang my rented togs in my closet when I heard voices raised in Cookie's cabin next door. Now, I realize someone of your high moral caliber would never do something as tacky as eavesdrop, but I had no such compunctions. In no time flat, I had my ear glued to the wall. Are you nuts? I heard Cookie saying. Spending the day with the old lady like that? You know you're not supposed to socialize with passengers off the dance floor. We could get fired. Don't worry, darling. Graham's a velvety British accent was unmistakable. They'll never fire me. <laughs> I'm very good at what I do. A little too good if you ask me, Cookie huffed. Why did you have to spend so much time with her anyway? Oh, sweetheart, <laughs> she's a lovely old lady looking for a little companionship. Lonely? She's traveling with her own posse. Surely you're not jealous. Besides, I told her all about us. You did? Cookie's voice began to soften. Absolutely. In fact, she gave me the name of a wonderful jeweler in Los Angeles who will give us a good price on our wedding rings. Wedding rings? She gasped. Of course, darling. <laughs> That's what one usually buys when one gets married. I have to admit, I was a tad surprised. After the way Emily had been mooning over Graham, it was hard to picture her playing matchmaker for another woman. Oh, great, Cookie's voice was all melty now. I wasn't sure. I mean, you always change the subject when I bring up marriage. I was beginning to think, well, no matter, I was wrong. I'm sorry I made such a fuss about the old lady. It's just that I hardly got to see you all day. That's why I'm here now, sweetheart, <laughs> he purred, to make up for lost time. At which point, I heard the faint whine of bed springs. Uh-oh. Looked like things were about to get X-rated. My cue to head off for the shower. <laughs> Should I? Oh, oh, my British biscuits. Oh, oh, my, my British tea bug delays. You? I don't know. I don't, I don't know how British people talk to each other and think, think of England. Hi, Pam. At home, I like to soak away my tears 
in the strawberry scented bathtub. Guys, let me tell you something. There are a few things in life more horrifying than hearing pe other people have sex. I actually would rather hear somebody vomit or go to the bathroom. Because, and I'll tell you why. Because I feel like hearing someone have sex can ruin your desire to like ever want to have sex. It could probably last for years. I still haven't had sex because I heard someone have sex once and it disturbed me so much. I, just, I still can't do it. But let me tell you, like, yes, vomiting. It's like, yeah, if you're vomiting, like it's gross, but I mean, it's already a bad thing, to, thing anyway. You don't, you can't really ruin it. It's not like, you know, it's not like a fun pastime. The same room as you. But, well, she was deliberately hearing at first. Crumpets. No such luxury here in the dungeon deck. All I had was a shower the size of a phone booth. I spent the next 10 minutes trying not to impale myself on the soap dish, all the while breathing in the heady aroma of Prozac's litter box. <laughs> I dried myself off with a threadbare towel, not much larger than a dishcloth, then slipped into my robe and undies. I took my time moisturizing and perfume spritzing and blow drying my hair, but then I could avoid it no longer the moment of truth had arrived. I took a deep breath and put on my rented togs. What do you think, bro? She sniffed at the hem of my skirt, much like she sniffs our garbage back home. Not a good sight. I forced myself to look in the mirror, and once more, I saw my grandmother looking back at me. Oh, crud. What would Robbie think when he saw me looking like a poster girl for Polygrub? I was standing there wondering what the penalty was for showing up on formal night in a pair of sweats when I heard a knock on the door. Who is it? I called out cautiously. It's me, Cookie. I opened the door and saw her leaning against my door drum in a short satin nightie. Ugh. Ugh. You ever hear the song? Um pour some sugar on me and he goes you got the peaches i got the cream so it's like i got the peaches you got the cream i hope she didn't have the cream running down her legs if you know what i mean <laughs> i wouldn't want to smell that i'm just saying yeah <laughs> Oh, Jane, she said, drifting into my cabin on a cloud of post whoopee bliss. <laughs> Loop, whoopee, uh, dipsy doodle. Whoopsie. <laughs> I had to share the good news with you. Graham was just in my cabin. So I heard. And he asked me to marry him. That's wonderful. When is the happy day? Well, we didn't exactly set a date. But Bram said he knows a place where he can buy our wedding rings. She plopped down on my bed and sighed. Oh, oh she's going to get something on your bed, girl. <laughs> I can't tell you how happy I am. Before long, I'm going to be Miss Cookie Esposito Palmer III. I smiled weakly. Something told me Cookie might have been jumping the gun a wee bit. Just because Graham knew where to buy a wedding ring didn't mean he was actually prepared to slip it on her finger. And I wasn't sure I even bought that wedding ring story in the first place. Oh dear, Cookie had come down off her cloud and was now eyeing my sorry outfit. You've been to the rental shop, haven't you? I nodded miserably. I look awful. Well, you won't when I'm through with you. Wait here, she said, dashing out the door. I'll be right back. Minutes later, she was back in my cabin with a professional makeup kit. 
I happen to be a whiz at this stuff, she said, dabbing foundation on my face. She did not lie. The woman was a regular makeup Michelangelo. When she was through with me, my eyes were bigger, my lips were fuller, and for the first time in my life, I had cheekbones. Now for your hair. With what seemed like just a few spritzes of hairspray and some deftly placed hairpins, she wound my curls into a sexy Sarah Jessica Parkerish updo. Well, I said, gazing at my reflection in the mirror, this is such an improvement. Wait a minute, I'm not through. With that, she took a pair of dangling gold earrings from her pocket and put them in my ears. The sales lady was right. Accessories did help. I didn't look half bad. I bet if I squinted my eyes and stood about three cabins away from the mirror, I'd even look skinny. Oh, Cookie, you really are my guardian angel. Don't be silly, hon, she said, wrapping me in a perfumed hug. I'm sure you'd help me out if I was in a jam. What neither of us knew at the time, of course, was that a jam of monumental proportions was right around the corner. <gasps> dum, 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 dum. Somebody's going to get killed. I don't know, like, a guy like Graham, like maybe he just, like maybe he gets his confidence from like flirting with everyone. I don't know. Like validate me, Grandma. Validate me. I don't. I don't trust him. Chapter seven. I made my way across the dining room that night feeling pretty good about the new improved me. My confidence was quickly shattered, however, by what I was about to see. There, floating above the table next to me, was a balloon reading, Happy 100th Birthday Ethel. Sitting beneath the balloon was a frail old woman with pink cheeks and blue hair. Ethel, no doubt, wearing a button that said, Kiss me, I'm 100. Well, good for you, Ethel. 100. Ugh. I can just imagine how sexy you guys are going to look when you're 100. You better be kissing my feet when you're 100. And that's not all she was wearing. You guessed it. The exact same outfit as me. <laughs> Yes, folks, I showed up dressed like a centenarian. You know what I like? Sextenarians. I, I like to say you put sex in sextenarian. So Jane, how lovely to see you, Emily said, catching sight of me. Once more, the others had arrived before me and were seated with their cocktails, all dressed in non-rented togs. Far more fashionable than mine. Emily wore a spectacular lace gown, set off by a string of magnificent pearls. I sure hope she was insured for. Maggie had on a champagne-colored halter dress that, although not perfectly flattering to her generous upper arms, undoubtedly sported a designer label. Even Mrs. Nesbitt had pulled out the stops and was wearing a tailored beige silk dupioni suit. Kyle and Robbie both wore tuxes, and Robbie, I couldn't help but notice, was looking particularly spiffy. His green eyes, startling against his tan, his sun-streaked hair, still wet from a shower. I smiled feebly and slipped into the vacant seat next to Emily, feeling about as stylish as the Volga boatman. I just prayed they hadn't noticed my centenarian fashion twin. No such luck. Oh, Jane, Miss Nesbitt said, the wicked gleam in her eyes. 
you're wearing the same outfit as the hundred year old lady over there. Isn't that cute? <laughs> Isn't that cute? <laughs> I felt like shoving the dinner roll in her big fat mouth, but I did not do any roll shoving because at that moment, Grandpa Palmer III came gliding up to our table. Once more channeling Cary Grant, I tell you, the man was born to wear a tuxedo. Good evening, everyone, he heard in a deep baritone. Oh, there, here's Graham again. Guess what? Emily's face glowed with pleasure. I've invited Graham to join us for dinner. Oh, my God. I bet you he porked that woman. <laughs> they made sweet, sweet loving. They, the bed was a creaking. Kyle looked up from his martini, not bothering to hide his irritation. But he's not assigned to our table. He is now here, the maitre d' said. There'd be no problem if Graham sat with us for the rest of the cruise. Oh my God, Kyle. Kyle, you're a cuckold. He's porking your wife. Do you just sit there and watch? The rest of the cruise, Kyle washed down his news, this news, with a big gulp of his drink. I had him bring an extra chair to our table, Emily said. Indeed, for the first time I noticed an empty chair at the table, two spaces down from Emily. I'd been so wrapped up in my fashion crisis, I hadn't registered before. Leona, dear, Emily said to Miss Nesbitt, why don't you take that chair? So Graham can sit next to me. Nesbitt blanched in disbelief, her face almost as white as her napkin. But I hate the trouble, Miss Nesbitt, Graham said smoothly. I can sit over there. No, Emily cried, like a child whose favorite toy has just been threatened. I want you here next to me. Jaw clenched tight in anger, Nesbitt grabbed her drink and changed seats, fuming as Graham slid into her vacated spots. And Nesbitt wasn't the only one who pissed. Who was pissed. Kyle, clearly upset at having his in, this interloper, interloper, cow, cow, in our midst, polished off his martini and signaled the waiter for another. Yes, indeed, there was tension in the air. And matters did not improve. When the waiter returned to take our orders, Madame, he asked, starting with Emily, the steak Mexicana looks awfully good, she said. It sure did. According to the menu, it was broiled to perfection and smothered in onions and roasted in red peppers. Good grief, Emily, Miss Nesbitt piped up, shaking her head. You can't have the steak Mexicana. Much too spicy. Oh dear, Emily sighed. I suppose I shouldn't. And that Graham did the unthinkable. He contradicted Miss Nesbitt. Oh, go ahead, Em, he said. Get what you want. Do you really think so, Gray? The steak's not that spicy, is it? He asked the waiter. Not at all, the waiter replied. And besides, Graham said with a wink, you only live once. Yes, Emily said, clearly under his spell. I think I'll have the steak. Nesbitt seethed as Graham shot her a smug smile. Another victory for Graham in the Emily Wars. The waiter proceeded to take the rest of our orders. Once again, due to my second class citizenship, I was saddled with the chicken, but the others were under no such restraints and I listened with envy as one after the other opted for red meats. Oh, Miss Nesbitt held back, sticking with her ghastly vegetable plates. Finally, the waiter trotted off, leaving our jolly party to converse with each other, which was about as easy as that Sisyphus guy trying to roll a boulder up a hill. What can I say? Conversation did not sparkle, not with Nesbitt and Kyle in full tilt snip mode. Emily, however, seemed oblivious to the tension crackling in the air and chattered gaily about the day's activities. Graham and I won second prize 
in categories. We had so much fun, didn't we, Gray? So what exactly is it that you do for a living? Kyle asked, clearly not interested in their categories victory. Graham's a retired corporate executive, Emily beamed. Fortunately, Graham said, I was lucky with a few investments, so I was able to retire young and pursue my love of cruising. Isn't it wonderful, Emily beamed. Gray loves cruising just as much as I do. How nice, Maggie said darting an anxious glance at her husband's rapidly draining martini glass. Where exactly did you work? Kyle asked. Oh wait, so that's Maggie's husband. All right, then I guess Emily is free to have her to cougarize her, her young cub. <laughs> the British Petroleum Corporation, Graham replied with a cool smile. For almost 20 years, I'll happily fax you my resume if you like. Touche, Graham, Robbie said, a twinkle in his eye. To which Kyle muttered, what I was certain was a hearty curse. Thank heavens the waiter showed up just then with our appetizers but alas he eventually abandoned us to our own company and the rest of the dinner slogged by under a thundercloud of tension with kyle and miss nesbitt irradiating hostility and poor maggie watching helplessly as her husband downed one martini after another i meanwhile was trying desperately not to reach over and cut myself a hunk of Emily's steak Mexicana. I was also busy trying to avoid eye contact with Robbie, who kept looking at me with that disconcerting grin of his. But what bothered me the most, more than the tension, more than the lure of the forbidden steak Mexicana, and Robbie's lopsided grin, was the way Graham was cozying up to Emily, gazing deeply into her eyes, and brushing her hand with the tips of his fingers. He sure wasn't acting like a guy who had a fiancé waiting in the wings. Ready to take another spin on the dance floor? Robbie whispered as we filed out of the dining room. Just say no, I warned myself. Do not get involved with a bad boy heartbreaker. He walked out on you last night. He'll walk out on you again. Please say yes, he said, sensing my hesitation. If you don't, I'll have to dance with the battle axe. He glanced over at Miss Nesbitt, who was discreetly popping a tums into her mouth. I steeled myself against temptation, but all it took was one sniff of his baby powder, and the next thing I knew, I was in his arms on the dance floor. Obviously, I missed class the day they passed out backbones. Do men smell like baby powder? You know what that remi just reminded me of? You guys ever, did you guys ever have, you know, it's coming to my mind like a Cabbage Patch doll, but I bet it's not only Cabbage Patch, like a new doll. I wonder if they dust dolls, like in like baby powder scents before they put them in the box and you can buy them. Yeah, have you guys ever smelled a doll, like a new doll? Like, do you guys have any dolls around that you could smell? <laughs> I'm telling the truth. I had this doll that I would sniff a lot, and she did smell like that. Graham had his charm turn. Oh, here we go. Graham and Emily were dancing alongside us. Emily happily ensconced in Graham's arms. For a woman of her advanced years, she bore an uncanny resemblance to a high school teenager, batting her eyes and giggling at her date's bon mots. Graham had his charm turned on full blast, earning every cent of what they paid him 
to keep the single ladies amused. Cookie was up on the bandstand, still radiant from her earlier tryst, belting out old standards. Every once in a while, Graham caught her eye and winked at her over Emily's shoulder. What an operator. Meanwhile, out in the audience, Kyle and Nesbitt were glaring at the happy couple. Kyle guzzling enough gin to open his own distillery. We're going to take a break now, the band leader announced, after Cookie wrapped up a lovely rendition of Blue Moon, but we'll be back in 10. I started off the dance floor, but Robbie pulled me back. Oh, let's not join the boobies, he said, eyeing Kyle and Nesbitt. What do you say we take a walk out on deck? This time, sensible me didn't even put up a fight. Sure, I managed to sigh. It was a beautiful night, the kind you see in cruise line commercials, mild and balmy with gazillions of stars in the skies. When you live with LA's perpetual overhead gunk, you tend to forget how many of those twinkling would probably turn to me and tell me how he'd always yearn to be a freelance writer with generous and then take me in his arms and wrap me in a torrid embrace. Apparently not. That was the hell, he said, not breaking stride. Oh, well, it was all for the best. He didn't make a pass at me. The last thing I wanted was to rush into things. Who am I kidding? At that moment, I wanted nothing more than to throw caution to the wind and plunge headlong into a lip lock. I thought Nesbitt would have a cow when Aunt Em asked her to change seeds. She was steamed all right. Good for Aunt Em, he said. I'm glad she's having fun. Poor things led a pretty sheltered life. She never married? No. She had some big romance when she was very young, but it didn't pan out. I just hope she's not falling too hard for Graham. You know, he already has a girlfriend. I wouldn't worry about that. Underneath her ditzy ways, Aunt Em's pretty sensible. She's been on enough cruises to know that Graham is one of those men hired to dance with a single women. Surely she can't think anything serious is going to happen between them. Obviously, he hadn't clue one about the self-deluding inner workings of a woman in love. <laughs> we stopped now and leaned against the rail, looking down at the moonlit waters below. Besides, Robbie said, it's not Aunt Emily's love I'm concerned about. It's yours. Mine, I flushed. What's with you and that ice sculptor anyway? Absolutely nothing, I assured him. Nothing at all. I just thought from the way you two have been together. No, Anton and I are definitely not an item. Any significant other back home, he asked. Play hard to get, I told myself. Let him think he has some competition. Make up some guy you're seeing occasionally. Aside from my cat, no. Way to go, Jane. Well, that's a relief. He inched just a tad closer. So tell me about yourself. What do you do when you're not sailing the high seas? I told him about my career as a freelance writer and my fondness for fine literature and crossword puzzles, carefully omitting my penchant for Chunky Monkey, Cosmo Quizzes, and daytime TV. You go in for water sports, he asked. Sailing, scuba, and stuff of that sort. And then the most outrageous lie popped out of my mouth. Oh, yes, I love it all. Was I nuts? The only water sport I enjoyed on a regular basis was soaking in the tub. Really? Somehow I didn't think you were the type. Oh, but I am, I said, digging myself in even deeper. I am a real water nut. Would somebody please shut me up? And it looked like Robbie was about to do exactly that because just then he reached out and ran his finger along my cheek. I felt a jolt of excitement I hadn't felt in many a moon. Much to my delight, he leaned in to kiss me. With any luck, I would not be doing any talking for the next 20 minutes or so. Our lips were just about to meet when I heard, hey, Jane, I've been looking all over for you. Bowie, it was Anton hustling over to us. Look what I made you, babe. He held out a plate 
and there in the center was a bright red jiggly blob. It's a rose carved out of jello. How nice, I managed to say. A precious flower for my precious flower. Oh, puke. Hey, babe, he said, wedging his way between me and Robbie. Did I ever tell you about the time I carved the Eiffel Tower out of egg salad? Man, that was some tough job. I mean, you've got to get the egg salad really cold and not use too much mayo. Otherwise, it's too runny. He proceeded to spend the next 15 minutes giving a blow-by-blow -blow description of the construction of his egg salad Eiffel Tower, his back to Robbie the entire time. What a fascinating story, Robbie said when he finally wound down. That's nothing. Want to hear about the time I carved Moses out of chopped liver? Some other time, Anton, I said. I think I'll turn in now. Me too, Robbie chimed in. With that, he grabbed my elbow and hustled me inside the ship where we sprinted along the corridors, certain that Anton would soon be hot on our heels. In here, Robbie said, pulling me into the ship's game room, a wood paneled enclave whose shelves were lined with board games and video rentals. Over at one of the tables, a bunch of kids were playing Uno. We cowered in a corner and Seconds later, we saw Anton rushing by. That guy is a human bloodhound, Robbie sighed. So there we were in the game room, me holding a jello rose, the kids at the table shrieking Uno at the top of their lungs. No moonlight, no twinkling stars, no bobbing breezes. The spell had definitely been broken. You know, Robbie said, I think I really will turn in. I'm sort of tired. Me too, I lied. What did I tell you? Dumped again. I was dying to make a pit stop at the buffet, but I couldn't risk running into Anton. So I trudged back down to the dungeon deck with nothing more exciting to snack on other than Jell-O Rose, which I wasn't about to eat, not after Anton had touched it. Back in my cabin, Prozac sniffed Anton's artwork disdainfully. This is your idea of a midnight snack. For once, we were on the same wavelength. With a weary sigh, I got in my jammies and plopped into bed. It was then that I noticed that Samoa had not brought me the pillow I'd requested most annoying. There were, after all, two beds in the cabin. There had to be another pillow for the second bed. I made a mental note to have a stern talk with my steward come novelist in the morning. In the meantime, Prozac was perched on our one and only lumpy specimen. After copious pleading and belly rubbing, I finally convinced her to relinquish her throne and lie on my tummy. Then I turned on the TV Believe it or not, my cabin actually had one and zapped around until I found Sleepless in Seattle on the ship's movie channel. Prozac and I spent the next hour and a half watching Meg Ryan and Tom Hanks fall in love. Rather, I watched Prozac was snoring five minutes after the opening credits. I don't think she likes Meg Ryan. She doesn't like anybody as cute as she is. Afterward, I sat through a highly educational spiel on the many fun and exciting tourist attractions in Puerto Vallarta, none of which I could afford. At about 1.30, I turned off the light, but sleep would not come. Visions of brownies danced in my head. I could resist the lure of the buffet no longer. Surely Anton wasn't still roaming around looking for me. I threw on my raincoat, rolling up my pajama bottoms so they wouldn't show and set out in search of empty calories. The buffet was surprisingly busy. Apparently, I wasn't the only late night snacker on board. I scanned the room on Anton alert, but much to my relief, he wasn't there. Five minutes later, I was trotting back to my cabin with a brownie for me and roast turkey for Prozac. I just approached my cabin door when I caught a glimpse of Cookie slipping into Graham's cabin a bright chartreuse sweater over her nightgown. 
first Tom and Meg, now Cookie and Graham. Love was all around me. I couldn't help but feel disappointed by the way Robbie had cut the evening short. True, the spell had been broken, but if he were really interested in me, would he have called it a night so quickly? I didn't think so. Oh well, I refused to let it get me down. We Austins are made of stronger stuff. Throughout the generations, our motto has always been, when the going gets tough, the tough get chocolate with nuts if possible. It worked for me. You got mail. What happened? Oh, here we're going to hear about her mom that has a crush on the gay neighbor. To Jousted from Shop to Lead Rock. Subject, off to Universal Studios. You would like that, Terry, because they have a, you know, they have a, a Terminator ride. Good morning, honey. It's a beautiful day here in sunny Los Angeles. And Daddy and I are off to the Universal Studios tour. I hear they take you on the street from Desperate Housewives. I just love that show. All the housewives are so cute, especially Felicity Parker Longoria. Oops, Daddy's yelling for me to hurry. Mustache, lots of love from mom. To Jane Austen from Shopley Drop. Subject, Desperate Housewife. We're back from Universal, what fiasco? I never got to see any of the Desperate Housewives or the street they live on. Would you believe Daddy tried to smoke his pipe on the tram? The tour guide, a lovely young girl named Kimberly, told him as nice as you please that there was no smoking allowed, which he should have realized since there was a, no, a big no smoking sign in the front of the tram. But did Daddy cooperate? No, of course not. He kept saying, that the no smoking sign didn't apply to pipes, especially one that was once owned by Basil Bradbone. Kimberly tried to reason with him, but would he listen? No. So before you could say elementary, my dear Watson, we were kicked off the tram right in front of the Jaws exhibit. Honestly, I felt like tossing your dad into the shark. All the passengers sat there and gawked as two carts hauled us off in a security cart. Some Japanese people even took our picture. I think they thought we were part of the show. The guards dropped us off at the main entrance and warned us to never come back to Universal Studios or any of its affiliates for as long as we live. I swear I thought I'd die. If Daddy thinks I'm going sightseeing with him ever again, he is sadly mistaken. Love from the original Desperate Housewife, Mom. P.S. One piece of good news. Before we got kicked off the tour, I got to talking with a darling young man visiting from Uzbekistan. I gave Vladimir your email address. True, he's not exactly geographically desirable, but who knows? He might just relocate to the United States one day. Two, Jane Austen. From Daddio, subject, such a fuss. Such a fuss, such a fuss. I don't suppose you know any of the haunt shows at Universal, do you, sweetheart? I intend to write them a very stern letter of complaints. Our prissy sniff of a tour guide went crazy, all because I happened to light my pipe on her stupid tram. Such a fuss. You think I'd taken out a loaded gun, but you'd be proud to know your old daddy stood up for his rights and kept on smoking. I wasn't about to let some little girl, barely out of diapers, tell Hank Austin what to do. And besides, everyone knows no smoking applies to cigarettes, not pipes. Once she saw that I wasn't going to weaken under her tyranny, the little despot had the nerve to kick us off the train right in front of the shark from Jaws, which I didn't mind a bit since I got to see the shark up close. Then two security guys showed up and gave us a ride back to the main entrance. Your mother is making a big stink, but if you ask me, it all worked out for the best. 
riding with the security guys, we got to see parts of Universal Studios that tourists never see. How many people can say they rode past the War of the Worlds porta potties? Now I'm off to the hardware store to pick up paint for that scuff mark on your wall. Love and kisses, Daddy. To joust him. From Shop Till You Drop, subject Picasso's Eye. Dear Jane, your father has gone to the hardware store to buy paint. He saw a tiny mark on your living room wall, so small, you practically need a microscope to see it. And now he wants to paint over it. He insists one of the policemen did it with his nightstick. But if you ask me, Daddy probably did it himself, bringing in the luggage. I told him he'd never be able to match the color of your wall, but he insists he can. He says he has Picasso's eye for color. Ha, huh. this from a man who can't tell his black socks from his blue, love, mom. Okay, I'm gonna keep reading. <laughs> Chapter 8. I mean, we have to find out who gets killed, don't you think? All right, feel free to put your final guesses in because I suspect who gets killed, we're going to find out coming up. Chapter 8. I foolishly checked my emails the next morning on my way back from the breakfast buffet. And now my scrambled eggs were curdling. in my tummy at the thought of daddy running up muck at Universal Studios. He'd be lucky if they ever let me in again. Things didn't get much better when I ran into Samoa down in the dungeon deck. Hey Samoa, I called out as he wheeled his supply cart along the corridor. Good morning, Miss Austin, how are you today? Fine, great, only I'd be a lot better if I had a pillow to sleep on, didn't you get my note? Yes, Samoa get notes. He smiled broadly, exposing several gold fillings. So, I said, there's a pillow missing from my cabin. Pillow not missing. Samoa has it. What are you doing with it? Samoa like sleeping with two pillows, he said, gracing me with another gold laced grin, much more comfy. Well, of all the colossal gall, I happen to like sleeping with one pillow, I pointed out, and I don't have it. You have pillow and cabin. Old and lovey, but you have one. Actually, my cat's using that one, so you need to bring me another, I said, shooting him the sternest look in my repertoire. Ah, yes, your cat. We don't want anyone finding out about Kitty and Cabin and locking her in dark hole cage, do we? Damn, he was playing the blackmail card again. No, I replied glumly. So, Samoa keeps Pello, he grinned, and everybody's happy. Samoa as a weasel. I knew where I wanted to shove that pillow right then. How are you coming along with my book? It's coming, Samoa, it's coming. Grinding my teeth in frustration, I stomped back to my cabin where I found Prozac snoring on the dratted pillow. Having polished off a plate of baked ham, I'd brought her earlier for breakfast. I was so darn steamed with Samoa, I couldn't bring myself to work on his god-awful manuscript. Instead, I 
grabbed a tube of sunblock and spent the next hour up on the pool deck doing crossword puzzles. Heaven. Absolute heaven. But, like all good things, it came to an end. At 9.45, I filed in a five, or filled in a five-letter word for devious devil. No, it wasn't Samoa. Devious devil, a five-letter word. John, John, what's the answer, my little, my little puzzle expert? A five-letter word for devious devil. I don't understand anything. Do you understand this? This. <laughs> Keep listening. When I showed up at my restaurant classroom, I was dismayed to see that my star pupils, Nancy and David, had gone AWOL. Drat. My anniversary couple were the only ones who expressed an actual interest in writing. How was I going to make it through the hour without them? If only Rita, the irritating Mary Higgins Clark fanatic, had been the one to take a powder. But no, there she was at the front table, scowling at me. Max, the snorer, was there too. As was Kenny, the teen slacker, his iPod still glued to his ear. Even Amanda, the knitter, had returned. I must admit, I was surprised to see her. I thought I made it clear to her that I wasn't Professor Hyman. You realize I won't be talking about the North Pole, I asked her. That's all right, dear, she said, needles quacking. And you still want to take the class? You have so few students. She tissed, her eyes round with pity. I thought I'd stay and keep you company. Mary Higgins Clark had 300 people show up at her lecture, Rita happily informed us. So, I said, putting a firm stop to the Mary Higgins Clark chatter. Who wants to read their essay? Rita's hand shot up. I nodded at her grudgingly. Okay, Rita, let's hear it. But she did not begin reading. Instead, she clamped her arms across her chest and said, with no small degree of belligerence, I looked you up on Google. Oh? And you had only one entry about the Golden Plunges Award you won from the Los Angeles Plumber Association. Your point being, I don't see how the cruise line can hire a lecturer who shows up only once on Google. Mary Higgins Clark has 17 pages on Google. That's more than Albert Einstein, she confided to the others. So Rita, do you have anything to read? I asked barely resisting the impulse to strangle her. And nope, she shrugged. I never got around to writing anything. Well, who does have something to read? I scanned the room and saw that Kenny, my teen slacker, was clutching a piece of paper. I believed Black back my surprise. Had he actually put pen to paper? Kenny, how about you? Okay, sure. He brushed back a hunk of hair from his eyes and began reading. The Scarlet Letter is this really stupid story about a lady who has to wear the letter A on her chest. I don't get it. All she did was sleep with a married man. I mean, half the kids in my class have moms who've done that. Um, Kenny, you were supposed to write about a first time in your life, not a book report. Yeah, well... This is a first, first time I ever wrote a book report. Hating to squash what little initiative this kid seemed to possess, 
I let him read the whole thing, which turned out to be little more than a paragraph, lamenting the shortcomings of both Nathaniel Hawthorne and Miss Tippett, his English teacher. Very interesting perspective, I commented lamely when he was through. Now that the ice has been broken, Max's hand shot up. Oh, read mine. After a phlegm-filled clearing of his throat, he proceeded to read us a rather graphic account of his first colonoscopy, <laughs> wherein he met his second wife. You may or may not be interested to learn that while the colonoscopy worked out just fine, the marriage did not. Very colorful, I said, when he was finished. Lots of vivid descriptions. Maybe a little too vivid of your bowel movements. And watch out for redundant expressions like fatso porker when describing your ex-wife. <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> Anyone else have anything to say about Max's story? I looked around, hoping that a lively discussion would ensue, but was met with a wall of silence. Oh dear, there were no more stories to read, no more comments to make. The class was over 10 minutes after it had began. What the heck was I supposed to do for the next 15 minutes? And then a miracle happened. Just as I was ready to start lecturing on the scarlet letter, David and Nancy came rushing into the room in matching mauve jogging suits. Never in my life was I so happy to see two people Aside from Ben and Jerry, of course. Sorry, we're late, David said. We were busy checking the decorations for the chapel. Tonight's the night we're renewing our wedding vows, Nancy chimed in, flushed with pleasure. That's wonderful, I said. And don't worry about being late. You're just in time to read us your essays. I hope they're okay, Nancy said. I'm sure they'll be fine, I smiled confidently. Whatever they wrote would seem like gold compared to Max's colonoscopy saga. I'll go first, David said, if that's okay with you, honey. Of course, dear, Nancy replied. He took out some papers from his jacket pocket, shook them out with a flourish, and began reading Our First Date by David Shaw. I will never forget my first date with my wife. It was a warm summer night, and I borrowed my dad's Impala to take Nancy to a drive-in movie. We saw the eight o'clock show of Rebel Without a Cause. Nancy, who'd been smiling up at him lovingly, held up her hand. Wait a minute, honey. It wasn't Rebel Without a Cause. It was East of Eden. It was? That's funny. I could have sworn it was Rebel Without a Cause. My mistake, sweetie. He smiled at her and started reading again. After the movie, we went to Mel's malt shop where we had burgers and fries. No, honey. Nancy interrupted. We had cherry pie a la mode. A twinge of irritation began to show on David's face. Burgers, pie a la mode, what's the difference? It was a snack, right? He picked up his paper and began reading again. Afterward, we drove out to, but we weren't about to learn what they went afterward. How could you forget we had cherry pie a la mode? Nancy pouted. Why else do you think I order it every year on our anniversary? I don't know. I thought you just liked it. Honey, let's not nip it. All I know is that I fell head over heels in love with you the minute I rang your doorbell and saw you standing there in your pink and gore sweater and matching poodle skirt. He turned to the class and beamed. She was the prettiest girl at Fairfield High. Wait a minute, Nancy said, eyes narrowed. I wasn't wearing a pink ink or a sweater and poodle skirt. I didn't even own a poodle skirt. The only one in school who even had a pink poodle skirt was Peggy Ann Martin. You fell head over heels in love with Peggy Ann. David scratched his head, puzzled. I could have sworn it was you. Uh-oh. I didn't like where this train was heading. You see, class, I butted in. That's why details are so very important in your writing. In fact, maybe this would be a good time to go over those writing tips I gave you last session. But my star pupils were not about to be distracted. I can't believe I broke up with Jeffrey Mutner to go out with you, Nancy snapped. 
You were dating Jeffrey Mutner? David's eyes grew wide with disbelief. You never told me that. Of course I did. Oh my God. No wonder you were so chummy with him at the reunion. I suppose you regret not sticking with him now that he's all big time used car dealer. Well, if I had known you were head over heels in love with Peggy Ann Martin, maybe I would have. Maybe you should have. Maybe you should call him right now. Maybe I will. <laughs> At this juncture, Amanda, who'd put down her knitting to watch the drama, commented to Max, such an interesting play, such talented actors. Maybe we should just call off renewing our vows. By now, David was shouting. I always thought it was a pretty silly idea anyway. Once was enough. Now you're telling me you didn't even like our wedding? Not with your Uncle Ed getting drunk and falling face first into the punch bowl. No, I didn't. How about we go over the, those writing tips, I said, trying desperately to stop the train wreck. But alas, it could not be stopped. And for your information, David shouted, his face as mauve as his dropping suit. I hate cherry pie a la mode. I don't want a divorce, Nancy wailed. Oh my God. Oh my God. <laughs> Over the cherry pie? Is it a la mode is when you add ice cream, right? Fine by me. Oh my God. Their 40 year marriage was falling apart right before my eyes. <laughs> all because of a writing assignment I'd given them. The next thing I knew, they were storming out of the class. What the hell was I supposed to do now? So, Rita, I said, uh, why don't you tell us some more about Mary Higgins Clark? <laughs> Guys, I don't even know Mary Higgins Clark. I don't even know what she wrote. Somehow, the class limps to a close, You'll be pleased to know that I did not race over to the Tiki Lounge to calm my shattered nerves with a frosty margarita. No, I did the sensible thing and ordered a Bloody Mary out of the pool deck. So much healthier, the tomato juice, you know. I sipped it while stretched out on a deck chair waiting for my nerve endings to stop doing the cha-cha. The warm sun good on my body and after a while the rhythmic lap of the waves lulled me back to near nap like state yes i was definitely mellowing out that is until i looked up and saw anton striding toward me in a t-shirt and cutouts his nose stood glinting in the sun good lord the man was wearing black socks with sandals if lance could see him he'd go into cardiac arrest Thanks to the vodka sloshing around in my veins, I didn't have the energy to run for cover. Instead, I took a healthy slug of my Bloody Mary, hoping it would numb me to the slimy passes to come. But much to my relief, Anton did not come on to me. You won't believe what happened, he huffed, flopping down onto the deck chair next to mine. Somebody stole my ice picks. Oh my gosh, how? Did they break into your cabin? I certainly hoped there wasn't a burglar running loose. The last thing I needed was someone barging into my cabin and discovering Prozac. Nobody broke into my cabin, Anton assured me, or my supply case either. The lock hadn't been broken. My guess is that someone stole them yesterday after the demonstration when I was talking to you. I remembered how he'd left his table unattended to ply me with his dubious charms. I put my tools away in a hurry and didn't bother to count them, but this morning I discovered two of them were missing. He looked around scowling. Damn passengers, they steal everything that isn't bolted down. Towels, salt shakers, and now my ice picks. What a bunch of lowlifes. This from a guy whose t-shirt said, love instructor, first lesson free. <laughs> what? Mind if I have a sip? Yes eyeing my Bloody Mary. Without waiting for a reply, he whipped it from my hand and polished it off in three gulps. <laughs> Thanks, he said, wiping his mouth with the back of his hand. I needed that. So did I, Buster. How about buying me another? 
So, Jane, what did you think of my jello rose? That lecherous look was creeping back into his eyes. Very nice, Anton, but you really shouldn't have done it. Just trying to win you over, babe, he winked. I already told you, Anton, I'm not interested. And I already told you, doll, I like a challenge. Okay, time to skedaddle. Gotta go, I said, hauling myself up from the chair. Aw, come on, Jane. What's it going to take to get you in the sack? General anesthesia. And with that, I scooted off to freedom. Anton's repulsive offer was almost enough to make me lose my appetite. Almost, but not quite. Somehow, my taste buds managed to rally and were now begging to be fed. So, I headed off to the buffet for a much-needed bite to eat. I was navigating one of the ship's many serpentine corridors when I saw Paige approaching from the opposite direction. The normally perky, peppy social director was looking neither perky nor peppy at the moment. Au contraire, her mouth was set in a grim line as she marched along, making notes on her clipboard. She couldn't possibly have heard what happened with David and Nancy so soon, could she? Nevertheless, Perhaps it was best I stay off her radar. I decided to duck into a nearby jewelry shop and pretend I was interested in one of their overpriced bottles. But it was too late. Paige had already spotted me. Jane, she called out. We need to talk. I mustn't panic. Just because she looked like she wanted to throttle someone didn't necessarily mean that someone was me. There were all sorts of things she could be steamed about. Maybe she ran out of bingo cards, or ping pong balls, or perky pills. Think positive, I told myself, as she tapped her pencil in an angry staccato on her clipboard. She probably had no idea of the marital disaster that had erupted in my classroom. I heard all about what happened in your class today, she snapped. So much for positive thinking. The little tiff between Mr. and Miss Shaw, I said, putting on my most innocent face. Really, Paige, it sounds a lot worse than it was. Why, I bet by now they've already kissed and made up. Mr. Shaw has just moved into a separate cabin. By now, icicles were forming in the atmosphere above us. Oh dear, is there anything I can do? Short of finding them a divorce attorney? I don't think so. The Shaws, along with 15 family members, are disembarking the ship tomorrow in Puerto Vallarta. Oh, crud. You realize, of course, that 17 passengers will never see again. I bet for a company as big as Holiday Cruise Lines, 17 people is just a drop in the bucket. Here at Holiday, she said, trotting out a gag from the employee's handbook, every passenger is our number one concern. Needless to say, she added, the wedding renewal ceremony has been canceled. And since we were comping the Shahs on their wedding cake, we think it's only fair that you pay for half. Don't you agree? Of course not. I wanted to shriek. Holiday Cruise Lines was a multi-million dollar operation. I was struggling freelance writer with enough unpaid bills to start a bonfire. But wimp that I am, I said, yes, of course. It was only fair. Besides, how much could half a cake cost anyway. 200 bucks. As I was to learn in, to my horror when I got the bill at the end of the cruise. Before I let you go, Jane, I just want to say that never in all my years as a cruise director has something like this happened. And with that, she let out a series of indignant sneezes. Gosh, I hope you're not catching a cold, I said, eager to change the subject. Of course not. I never catch colds. Feels like my allergies are acting up. She sneezed again. If I didn't know better, I'd swear there was a cat on board ship. Ah, uh, I said, feigning hilarity. What a crazy idea. Well, must run and do some prep work for my next class. Ciao for now. With a jaunty wave, I dashed off, praying she hadn't noticed the generous coating of cat hairs clinging to my slacks. Down in the dungeon deck, I flung myself on my pillowless cot wishing I could ditch this cruise from hell and disembark with the Shaws in Puerto Vallarta. But as you know, we Austins are made of sterner stuff. No way I would walk out on my contract. That's because I had integrity, because I had principles, and most important, 
because I couldn't afford the airfare back home. Lying there in a miserable lump, I leafed through the ship's notices that I had accumulated in the little plastic docket outside my door. There among the flyers from the ship's boutiques was a handwritten note from Emily asking me to please join her and her little family in her suite at 6 p.m. for cocktails and hors d'oeuvres. At least I was still in Emily's good graces. I checked my watch five more hours until the hors d'oeuvres kicked in. In the meanwhile, it was time to make that proverbial leap from the frying pan into the fire. Yup, ever the glutton for punishment, I picked up a pencil and returned to my chores in the literary gulag known as Do Not Disturb. That is the end of chapter eight. And we still have no one that's murdered yet in eight chapters? The hell? We have a divorce. We have a death of a marriage. I don't even know who's gonna die. <sighs> well, to be continued on Sunday. <laughs> Building to suspense. I feel like my lipstick tonight, it's a lip mousse. From urban decay it's like this it's like this like powder so i had to like press it on i don't know if that's what i'm supposed to use but but i feel like it stays more good job thank you thank you ah so i should have enough time to maybe have something to eat her books always make me hungry because she loves food she eats like it's her hobby and so do i um, yeah, I only got to sit, finish setting that TV up, but I can't wait to have it on and have all my apps back. And, um, yeah, I want to watch Big Brother. Do we know yet who got evicted too? Who is HOH is? Let's see. No, probably. Well, I won't spoil it for you without warning you if I know it. How would you know, Dwight? Wow, you weren't even watching. Wow, my nightmare. <laughs> okay. Glad I got you into the show. I guess I'll not waste more of your time. Good night.